Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Do Business Better podcast. We talk to real life entrepreneurs, business owners, people who have been there and done that, and they give you lessons on their business that you can learn from and apply to your own life and business. We're talking about creating a life and business by choice. My guest today is a guy that I've known since I was a little kid. He grew up down the hill from me on a farm just down the road from my farm. His name is Lawrence, sometimes known as Larry or LT Kreider. He is the proprietor of Z Place, a restaurant, a small town pizza place. What's this guy? I know about business. Well, he's tripled the revenue in about a decade, and you're going to learn what you can do. You know, maybe you are not the start from scratch person. You're the kind of person that wants to buy an existing business. Well, sometimes the ones that you're buying are turds, or they've been let go. They've atrophied, and that's what happened here. So, Larry Crowder, let's talk about everything. Give me the backstory. You were a corporate guy. You were in sales. Take me from there. Um, In sales for approximately 23 years with two organizations, three, it's actually three organizations, uh, started out in the beer business with a distributor. Um, they sold to a larger company, worked about five years from them. And then at that point they were, uh, looking to build a new $6 million warehouse and looked at eliminating costs. And at that point they eliminated my job. And then, uh, from that point took a job with a, uh, liquor and wine distributor worked for them for a couple of years until the recession of uh 2008 got kind of got the best of them so at that point they uh, also looked at uh eliminating some salary uh, this place came available in about 2010 worked on closing the deal for from july 3rd of 2010 the first offer was made till we finally closed St. Patrick's Day 2011 when I received the keys. Okay, so you started working on it, and it took you about six or nine months to get the deal done. So you received the keys to this restaurant, a brand that's been known in our community since we were kids, but it's also been kind of atrophy to let go. It was not loved. Uh, what did it look like? I'm thinking that this this bill this business was around when I was a little boy, right? So 40-some 40, 40 years. Since 1969, they started their first location in a trailer um, on the north end of town behind a gas station. And I still have uh, employees who worked there at that time come in. Uh, one was the son of the original founder from the Pyle family. And uh, he told me the first night they had orders for 450 pizzas. First night they were open. <laughs> Very first night that's in a, a trailer. That's a hell of a way to start <laughs> things out. So, okay, so it's as old as me. 1969 is the year I was born. So I remember this kind of business as a kid. It's still my favorite pizza on the planet. I love it. I've turned my wife onto it and moved back around here. At one point, the Z Place had three facilities here in our little community. Uh, by the time you came into the thing, it had one facility. That's where we're sitting right now is in that one the same facility. Um Take me from uh, the history then to, to you coming into it. You had a history. You knew about this place. You pursued it. You must have thought there was some potential here. Oh, definitely. I, I'd eaten here since I was 11 years old. And uh, actually, to back up a little bit, Z Place actually had seven locations at one time. Oh, jeez. Okay. Um, in and around the area. Okay. Had one in Columbia City. Yeah. So, one in Roanoke. Okay. Uh, they actually had a franchise, what they called a franchise in Markle, and uh, three in Huntington. And one in North Manchester. All right. So I guess I didn't know that. So seven facilities, seven seven facilities, seven outlets, if you will, seven stores, and it's down to one. So you started eyeballing it. You were thinking, okay, I've been in sales. I've been in the, you're, you're you're affiliated with the restaurant and bar business. I remember you worked in a restaurant and bar thing, sort of part time, also in addition to being in uh, corporate sales. So tell me about then pursuing this. How'd it come about? Um, my friends and I were actually sitting in there eating one night as I was laid off from the. Uh, liquor position that i was in as a district manager and uh they said hey we hear this place is up for sale i said really and one of my other friends said you should buy this i said that's a great idea i'll start looking into it okay so at that point we progress forward with the whole situation and as scary as it can be you have to know what's really there and what's not there all right so Talk about that. So the person that's listening to this says, you know what? I like the idea of buying something. And everybody and her sister thinks they're going to buy a restaurant. Everybody, think, you know, everybody and her sister, they walk into a bar and they say, it'd be fun to own a little Worst bar Worst like idea this. ever. Yeah. 
And, and, and you and I know, because we've worked in the bar and restaurant business, they think, ah, oh, you buy a beer for 47 cents, sell it for 275 How can't you make money? Tell us about being in the bar and restaurant <laughs> business. Actually, um, coming in here, I had a look at everything that was on the books for the prior three years to owning it. Yeah. Uh, I have two friends. One's a multinational CFO and another who's a finance guy with a, you know, master's degree in finance and business. Both of them looked at it and said, LT, I don't see it. You're going to fail. Okay. We do not see the numbers. Okay. But being around, I knew that the numbers were there, but they weren't where they needed to be to where someone buying the place could actually see it. Okay. So, uh, you know, restaurants come, restaurants go. It's probably the the biggest failure uh, in and out of business uh, sector. You know, everybody's heard the thing that uh, most businesses fail within five years. And I actually say, you know, some of them don't fail. The owners just give up. The people that start these things say, oh, my God, this is hard. You're not afraid of working. You've been you grew up working. You knew there's going to be work. What did you what did you think the business needed? Just love, attention, work ethic, the marketing, business, the product? business, the business needed somebody here all the time being in and out of uh, the corporate world. I called on a lot of businesses and the owners were absentee. Uh huh. Not there, not seeing what's going on, not looking at their costs. Uh-huh. That was a big thing coming in. The costs need looked at. And okay. it's tough making a, a price adjustment. Okay, so first off, age. first off, it was attention, just attention, because uh, the, the people that owned it, they're not here touching it. And you think you got to touch it. Exactly. And up until uh, about a year ago, I was fixing things that they had left behind and left unattended. So even after from a, a maintenance, even standpoint. after a decade, it just things had been let go. So you fixed stuff for a decade. Yes. Uh, all right. And then you talk about costs. Um, what are you talking about? Like the materials, the stuff that goes on a pizza that they were letting letting get away from? Yes, they weren't actually looking at uh, what their cost was in a pizza, and then looking at the margin they needed to make to survive in business. Okay, especially in a restaurant. Okay. So you said from the very beginning, you're like, I think that I can start by just peeling down costs. Well, and actually, when I came in and looking at the menu and looking at my cost on products, they were breaking even on fish dinners, chicken dinners, and multiple other items. Right. And then they also had the opportunity to create more items with the products they already had here on hand, which they never addressed. You okay, know? so they had products you think that weren't selling, and then they also were missing out by not having products that would have sold? Yes. Okay, so yep. you, you, you pared down. You started with menu, which then means product. Exactly. And then did you change the consistency or the quality of the product? Actually, uh, one of the first things I looked at from a product standpoint, and this is perfectly acceptable in the pizza business, they were pinching raw beef and raw sausage on their products. Uh huh. And at that point, it it created a greasier pizza, uh-huh. as Z Place was known for a long time as a Z greaser. Uh huh. Um, so I eliminated that, and the Board of Health gave me. A pat on the back and said, attaboy. Because <laughs> you, you changed it. You just changed the ingredient, the fact that it was, went from being uncooked to cooked? Correct. Okay. And it cooks on the pizza, but it just creates such a potential cross-contamination problem. Okay, so you did that from a standpoint of health and also from product. Uh, feedback from the customer base when you started changing the product, good, bad, indifferent? Uh, very few people were indifferent. Um a lot of them, they were like, where's all the grease? Uh-huh. And I'd have to explain to them. As uh, one of the founders, Norm Brown, said, those are flavor juices. Uh-huh. So anyway, I changed that to a pre-cooked product. And, of course, that was about a six-week um, episode of searching products that are very quality. Uh-huh. Um, I won't sacrifice quality unless we absolutely have to at some point. And I'll let my customers know from the very beginning. Okay. Because sourcing product throughout the last uh, 16 months has just been a challenge. Yeah. So during the whole pandemic, we're, we'll get back to the other stuff. During the whole pandemic, I want to talk about that in a minute. But here's the thing that we got to cover, though. Pricing. Um, you bought a business that was break even at best. And then you got a loan and you, you know, you, you uh, said, I, I got to do this. And it wasn't like the guy that says, I'm going to buy a bar. It'd be kind of fun sitting here and visit my friends. You're like, no, God, exactly. damn it, I got to make this thing work. This is my business. This is my livelihood. I got to pay for my kids. Um, 
Did you change prices? Almost immediately. Yeah, because a lot of folks think, uh, I'm afraid that my price is going to lose my customers. Tell me about changing prices. Exactly. Well, it's just a matter of sitting down, looking on at how much cost you had in a product and applying the proper margin to it to know you could pay your taxes, pay uh-huh. your employees, uh, take care of needed maintenance. Do you think a lot of people that are in the bar and restaurant business don't really, they don't even know their costs? They don't realize they, they just... There's they re- probably ha- 50% of them out there have no idea what they're paying for. A bottle of beer, a shot of bourbon. Yep. Um, when I go over here, and if I go over here and get a bucket of, uh, of uh, chicken from you, you know what it cost us. Yes. Down to the nickel, down to the penny. Pretty close. <laughs> All right. And then you raised the prices. Did you get any bad feedback? Did it hurt your business? Because I tell a lot of small business people, I say, you got to raise your prices. No, no, I can't do that. I'll lose business. I said, no, you need to raise your prices. You actually don't lose business. If you're making product like it's for you or somebody you love, people will never complain about the quality. They might complain a little bit about the pricing, but they always come back. Okay. See, I think that goes from landscaping to dry cleaners to everybody. Exactly. I said, if you, if you are working it like it's your business and you're in there giving it the love, uh, don't be afraid to charge more. Um, you know, I, I charge for my services, and I don't apologize about it. Okay, pandemic comes along. So you're 10 years in. You made a bunch of changes. Things are growing and going, and all of a sudden, they're shutting down bars, shutting down restaurants. Uh, people are at home. All, uh, stuff's going crazy. How did it work for you starting uh, in the first month or two of the whole shutdowns? Well, in the first month, I was scared to death, not necessarily for myself, but somewhat for my business yeah. and for my employees. Right. My employees depend on a check, uh-huh. and if I'd have to close the doors, they would not survive. Okay, so you didn't have to close the doors because you're carry out. Did you have to close the doors to in person? You did. Um, yes, we closed the dine-in for... I'd have to look back at my notes. I keep a journal every day of what transpires because if you don't know where you've been, you have no idea where you're going. Uh huh. And um, so you keep a journal, meaning uh, at the end of the day, you're going to say, "Here's what you know." Of course, you got numbers. What what the what sales looked like, and then do you put in there sales were off, and here's why? Or is- I I will make a note to that, or here's why sales were up okay um if there's a special event we do a catering event all right um just a multitude of numerous things but yeah i list it down to total sales credit card sales online credit card sales cash change and checks okay so and then i make a note about the weather do you also think do you think that a lot of people in business, I think that's overkill? Because I, I keep track of my monthly revenue, and I also make some notes about what changed, what thing happened there. Do you think most people do that? Uh, probably not. Yeah. Most people don't do that because they don't want to take the time to do it. Or I do it because I want to see how cash flow is changing, how credit cards are changing, how all of that's tra- how checks yep. are changing from a monthly to a yearly basis. I think most people don't really keep a good handle on it because they're lazy or more importantly, uh, and not lazy, but they just, they just don't want to put in that effort. Or sometimes it involves you got to be a little bit self-critical. When I look at what, what happened here, why, why is this quarter off? What did I do wrong? Right. Uh, and just like recently, our Mondays have just exploded. Our Monday sales are, are over doubled. And I'm like, what is going on? Well, come to find out. One of our competitors is closed because they can't get employees to work Monday. Okay. They don't have enough employees. Another competitor, uh, local restaurant, they've closed on Mondays. Another pizzeria is closed on Mondays. Oh. So we become an, a more limited option from the independent pizzeria standpoint. Sounds like a great idea to stay open on Mondays for you. Oh, it has been. <laughs> okay. So the pandemic comes along. You were worried. You didn't get shut down. You shut down your dining. Where we're sitting right now, you couldn't eat here, but you could still do carry out. Did it go crazy? Yes, it did. Delivery and pickup? Yes. Okay. We went from uh, 11,000 deliveries, just over 10,000 deliveries a year to 12,000 deliveries a year. Okay. And we started using a lot more carryout product. Okay, so you're, you're almost talking about 20% increase in deliveries? Yes. Okay, and then also that's not counting pickup, people coming to the door here and getting it themselves. Correct. And that went up as well. Yep. All right. And during COVID uh, last year, there was only one month of sales we were down. All right, you talked about changing your product. You talked about upping your prices. So you upped your price, changed your product, and you started paying a lot more attention and fixing things that had been let go. Is that how you go from what you were to triple? Because you told me when we uh, before we started recording that you have three times the business or so. Is it just that simple or is there something else? 
It's a lot of things. It's a, it's attention to detail. It's, uh, it's enabling your employees and teaching them how to do the right thing instead of doing the right thing for them. Okay. Being an empowering boss instead of an enabling boss. Um, you know, a, attention to a lot of details. Cleanliness. This dining room had uh, folding chairs and uh, folding tables in it. <laughs> you know, I went on an active search for booths. I was almost looking at having someone manufacture booths, but luckily I found someone who'd purchased a, another pizzeria outside of town and they were looking to move their booths and tables. So okay. I bought them. You bought them. So that's, you know, you said attention to detail. And I think that's an interesting thing because um, I, go, I go into businesses and I see things and I'm like, do they not see this? Do they not see what I'm seeing? You know, the the person that's on their phone jacking around instead of, being uh, attentive to me and I'm the paying customer, uh, things like that, that I see you come in here every day and you try and look at it like your customer. Yes. First thing I do is I look at the floors, see how clean the floors are. Mm -hmm. If they do a good job vacuuming the night before mm -hmm. cleaning up my restaurant, people don't want to eat in a dirty place. I check the bathrooms. I check the tables to make sure they're properly clean. Nobody wants to sit at a dirty booth or dirty table. Only about a fourth of your business is dine in. A lot of it is pickup or uh, delivery. So how do you affect that? How do you, how do you affect that uh, to make sure the customer's experience happens when it's happening at their doorstep? Well, as you know, I'm one of the few kitchens that has an open kitchen. You can see almost everything as soon as you walk in. Yep. We've got to keep that kitchen clean. Yep. Employees have to look decent. Mm -hmm. um, food product and how we handle it has to look proper from a, a public standpoint. You've got a neat thing going that I just asked you about before we started recording. You might notice if you're viewing this. By the way, you should view this. Remember, dear listener, this is available as an audio on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you get your audio podcast. But it's also available as a video on my YouTube channel. I would love for you to subscribe. Go to the Damian Mason channel. It's very simple. Go on YouTube and just type in Damian Mason channel and hit subscribe. It'll help me get viewed. And that way people can see people like Larry Kreider here uh, who's got a great business. So if you are watching, you'll see there's a little piece of art back here. And I think this is really pretty cool attention to detail he's straightening it out right now he's got a deal and i think this is pretty cool doesn't make him any money particularly but he's helping out and it's also creating some ambiance tell us about the art um it's got a I, price tag on it right there by the way actually i have an art coordinator and this idea came to me as i was in chick-fil-a it's one of my favorite chains they do just simple little things right pay attention I, to details i noticed every three days they had new flowers on their table which is ridiculously expensive and it looks nice, but I'm like, I can't do that. So I knew in this community, there was an abundance of art talent. Mm -hmm. So I went out and found an art coordinator, discussed things with her, uh, Chris Burcroft, by the way, she mm -hmm. owns gallery K, which just recently opened That's cool. in Fort Wayne. Very, Very cool. cool. She opened her own gallery. Um, but she goes out and sources me local artists, tells them what their requirements are, what they have to do, how many pieces of art they're going to need to hang on my wall. Um, about every two to three months, she brings a new artist in. We display them. They put prices on them and they sell them. I'll collect their money, sell their art. At the end of the show, I give them all their money back. So it changes out your decor. It also demonstrates community involvement and support, and uh, probably people think it's cool. I think it's cool. Plus, you know, this is sourced throughout all of northeastern Indiana, and at times we get new customers that are friends with the artists or like the art, and, and they'll they just come, come in, in to eat. And all of a sudden you're selling, you're selling pizzas and chicken to people because they wanted to see this kid Brian's uh, piece of art. A whole different new clientele. It's fantastic. It's just like if you want to have a production that's well attended, put as many children in there because the grandparents, and will come to anything that their grandkids are in. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's talk about here. Be honest, buddy. Um, I've made plenty of mistakes. You and I have known each other for a long time. You know that I've, I've done okay, but I've also I've had some really uh, flops. Uh, tell me about a flop. Tell me about uh, a mistake. Tell me about a uh, holy shit. I didn't see this coming. Um, really, it was uh, when good employees who seem to be happy here have a lifestyle change, mm -hmm. marriage, get children, divorced, kids whatever, get divorced, right? and they decide they need to go do something else. It, it almost completely catches me off guard. And then when I have a good employee I have to replace, that's, that's kind of devastating. How many employees do you have generally at any given time? A dozen? Approximately 16 on payroll. Okay, 16 on payroll. Uh, you gave one big lesson about empowering versus enabling because the more you enable them, the less competent they are and the less responsibilities they take, et cetera. You got any other employee tip? 
every employee learns at a different rate and in a different manner. Some are hands-on, some are visual. It's, it's all different. I teach my general manager who now does all my hiring, firing, and training to make sure he understands the individual that he's hired yep. and handle them the proper way. Uh, okay, we talked about flop. We've talked about employees. Uh, something that surprised you um, in a good way uh, or a bad way. Something that surprised you. You'd been around the bar and restaurant business. You worked in it. You worked. You sold to it. And then all of a sudden you're in here. And a year in, you're like, man, I, I, I didn't see this coming. It was deliveries. You know, all the years that Z Place had been open, they had never delivered. And I don't know whether it was because of insurance regulations, hiring delivery people or what, but the feedback I got from everybody when I told them I was buying Z Place was, oh, my God, I love Z Place. So hence I changed the logo to I Heart Z Place. Yeah, Pizza. right, right. There's and marketing. people live it, breathe it, eat it yep. every day. And at that point, I thought, you know what? They have also told me if you change your breadsticks – I'll never go to the other place down the street. So I went on a look for breadsticks. We now sell a minimum of 750 breadsticks a week. Okay. So and then and then at that point, they also said, if you had delivery, we'd never go anywhere else. I'm now, like, now I was one of those people because I love Z Place, and then I live out in the country, and you deliver to me, and I appreciate that. But here's the thing. There is a peril to listening to customers. You know, the old thing, uh, Henry Ford was famous for saying, if I'd asked the customer what they wanted, they'd have told me a faster horse. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's that thing. So I'm sure that a lot of people tell you a lot of stuff. You know, people, I, I, you know what, I'd, I'd give you a business if, and then you do the if, and then it doesn't. How'd you go about actually parsing through the customer feedback? Because you'll hear a lot of stuff from a lot of people. And it doesn't amount to sales. Well, a lot of times you have to take everything the customer says with a grain of salt. Sometimes it's like, okay, I'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. And it's just not feasible. But the delivery thing seemed really rational because you're like, for God's sakes, if everybody loves this product, let's make it more available. And then the deliveries just exploded. It was about two years in when you started them? Uh, actually, six months after I took over the place. Six months in, you started the delivery thing, and it just blew up. Yes, it okay. did. I and mean, I was scared to death to do it. Hired three delivery drivers, purchased all these delivery bags, um, got everything situated to where we could just run and go, verified my insurance was coverage, had the coverage for my drivers, everything I needed uh, to get up and go. And, you know, there was a point early on where I'd have two delivery drivers here at lunch. Well, I... Yesterday was the first day I had not one delivery at lunch. I was like, well, I should have seen this coming. But after 10 years of delivering, this is a first. Yeah. Uh, that brings up another thing. You know, I've been around. I've been running my own thing for 27 years. I'm starting my 28th year. I uh, am better about not flipping out. <laughs> where you don't let one one incident, one day, one bad week, one bad month, you get to where you're like, okay, I've been through this before. Uh, when did you get there when you didn't like start having panic attacks and flipping out and not sleeping at night? Because I'm, I'm better about that now than I used to be. Uh, about three and a half years ago after my massive heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you said. That's what you said, I'm not going to flip out. I'm not going to stress and lay there at night. Well, and I had to replace my office door. Because <laughs> I literally punched it and ripped it off the hinges. I was so upset one day. I'm like, this just isn't worth it. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when did you uh, when did you say, I got this? Because there's always some scary moments. Uh, it was for me. It's happened a few different times. About a year in, I'm like, I got this. You know, I was 26 years old. And I'm like, no, I, I think I got this. And then you go through some setbacks and you're 33 or four or five years old. And you're like, son of a bitch. I, I don't think I got this. And then it comes back. So how many times was it? I got this. Then you're like, oh, maybe I don't. It was probably about three years in just looking at numbers and sales and employees and the overall business and what needed done, what didn't need done. Probably about three years in. When you look at other businesses as a business owner, you know, and I look at it as a self-employed guy that's, you know, obviously worked for a lot of different organizations in the speaking consulting radio, I, I just try and always observe things. What's the observation you have about what they're doing wrong, what, what they're doing right? You got any examples of some some company, some company, some business that's like, man, they, I, I, it's not my place to tell them, but they got this wrong. I've always said I won't step over dimes to pick up dollars. 
There are so many companies out there that step over all these dimes. step over dollars to pick up dimes, but yes. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, what are you guys doing? Right. Why Why are you doing it this way? I'm not a place to say, but, you know. Yeah, why, why are, it seems to me that you're putting in a lot of effort to, to, make, to save a nickel when you're actually blowing $3 to save that nickel. Exactly. Kind of yeah, exactly. I, I see it also. One of the things I see, I think companies that make it difficult to do business with them. You know, I, I genuinely hate... When I have to call somewhere and then go through six minutes on the phone of a phone tree and a push this and a push this, I, I do everything I can to not have to do that. And you're like, oh, we can do it on the Internet now. Sometimes websites aren't a whole hell of a lot easier. So I think that companies make it very difficult to be a customer. I hate that. Did you do anything to make it easier to be a customer? The delivery was one thing. Is there anything else you did to make it easy to be a Z-Place customer? Well, I saw all the corporate chains and food restaurants go to an online ordering system at one point i sat down researched for several months and then i decided to pull the trigger and go online ordering and it's it's been wonderful for so us. people do do it yes yes i see uh all right then <clears throat> three times in it you talked about all the reasons you did that where does it go then from there you gonna you gonna stay here forever you gonna you gonna groom your replacement Actually, I've already started grooming my replacement. He's been here two longer, two years longer than I have. Um, his hopes are to buy the business at the end of 2022. Okay, that's fantastic. Then where does Larry Crater go? Um, hopefully, I find myself a nice little spot in Tennessee eventually, uh, somewhere between a lake with a new pontoon and a golf course to where I can go golfing regularly, and I pick up a hobby that may or may not be profitable, but just enjoyable for me and relaxing. You going to work in the restaurant business? Probably not. I always tell my delivery drivers they make so much money running deliveries that I'm going to quit my job and become, become a pizza a delivery, delivery driver. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that either. Okay. Uh, last lesson, thought, thing that you would tell somebody. They're thinking about starting and or buying a business. What do they need to know? Take care of yourself. That's the most important thing. If you don't work this business and work it a lot, it's going to fail. But you need to make time to take care of yourself. <clears throat> because you had a heart attack three years ago? Well, that, that's part of it. But, I mean, you know, you got to buy great shoes. Not just good shoes, great shoes. Because you're going to be on your feet. Be on your feet a lot. Going to be moving a lot. Yeah. Going to be moving around a lot. But you've got to make time for your family, your friends, and most importantly, yourself. Yeah, I think that's a, a biggie right there that uh, Lori's like, you're getting more lax a day, like a days ago, more laid back. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm in my 50s and I've been working since I was eight. I said, it's probably OK to do that. Uh, so that was your last tip, your last lesson. Anything else that we didn't cover on this podcast that we should have about being in business? Just be prepared, be ready for it and always hire good outside support. Are such you, as an accountant and an attorney. That's the one thing. I always say there's th three kinds of support. You've got the, the person that will be honest with you because that's real support. Someone will say, hey, LT, I'll tell you what, man, this th this this is a, a problem. A lot of people won't do that. I think you need support means somebody will be truth. You need support from a professional standpoint. You need that accountant and that exactly. attorney and the, all those you know independent consultants, et cetera, et cetera. There's different kinds of support. You happier now? being a business owner than you were being an employee definitely so you still would tell somebody that's an aspiring entrepreneur do it go for it be prepared and go for it you will never make any real money working for somebody else Whew, that's it right there his name is larry crater if they want to check out where you uh, to order online or to learn more about your business how do they find you the my image my email is listed on my website what's the website I love zplace.com. I love zplace.com. And they can order a pizza while they're there and they can learn more about your place. Exactly. Or just come in. I'm here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Till next time, it's the Do Business Better podcast. Thanks. Thank you.